Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. Very happy to welcome to the event space Kathy Adams Clark. Kathy, how are you today? I am good. Thanks, Scott. Awesome. Wonderful to have you. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. We are super excited to be talking with Kathy about bird photography specifically, featuring the Canon EOS R7. So as always, huge thank you goes out to our sponsors over at Canon. Thank you very much to them for sponsoring this event and getting us together with Kathy. Everybody who's joining us, whether you're joining us on Facebook, Vimeo, live stream, or just here on Zoom, thanks for being here. If you do have any questions for Kathy that you want to get in, please feel free to do so. If you're joining us on any of those live stream options, you can use the comment section or just on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab. But otherwise, without further ado, I know Kathy's got a ton of information she's going to share with us and a great presentation. So I don't want to take any more of her time. I want to give her the floor. Thanks for being here. And I'll see you back in a little bit, Kathy. Thanks, Scott. So I'm going to share my screen now. There you go. So thank you all very much for having me today. And thanks everybody in the audience for joining me. I hope that you enjoy this and to B&H and Canon for sponsoring this program. Um, I like to photograph all kinds of things like star trails and buildings at night, and landscapes and macro and travel and even crystal balls. So if you ever want a crystal ball photography class, I can teach you how to do that. But if I get a bird in front of me, this is where I am in heaven. And all that I want to do is photograph that bird and stay with that bird and experience that moment of almost intimacy with that bird. And I've been photographing birds since the late 1970s, early 1980s. I show you this picture. This is the first picture that I ever had published. It is a gray silky flycatcher. 1984, published in one of the birding magazines. And by 1984 standards, this was an acceptable photograph of a bird. And within a year, I had perfected my technique and gotten even better. This is published in 1985 in Bird Watcher's Digest, Cactus Wren in a Cactus, done with ISO 800 film. So it's grainy as all get out. And I show you those two pictures. Because by 1980 standards, those were acceptable bird photographs. But because of the camera equipment that we've got now, and because of the technology that we've got now, we are pushing the envelope of bird photography all of the time and reaching new levels of photographing birds. That's just amazing. A bird's job is to stay camouflaged from us, from predators, because if you think about it, we are, humans are predators. So a bird's job is to stay hidden. And you might see three parrots in here really quickly, but really there's nearly five or six parrots in here. Our job as a bird photographer is not only to capture the photograph of the bird, but also to move it to a little bit different level so that it's, it's not just an ID shot. It's not that we simply have that house finch in the frame or even that we've got a catch light in its eye, but our job as a bird photographer is that we move it just a little bit further to make it something that's worth looking at. And now with technology, we're getting into more action photography. We're getting into more bird pho uh, behavior photography. So no longer am I accepting just that static photograph of a bird, unless it's the first time I've ever seen that bird. I really want to show more field marks since I am an editorial photographer and, you know, I'm working with the publications to illustrate the different aspects of a bird. I want to show people how a bird makes its living, such as being camouflaged, like this screech owl. I want to show people what field marks this bird has to make it unusual, like this sword-billed hummingbird, or geographic variations like this booted racket tail. So our bird photography has really moved to a new level over the past 20 years. And I think that's what makes it so much fun. We have a lot of different equipment options out there. 
So for those people who just want a one piece unit, um, we've got all kinds of great cameras on the market that allow people to not have to interchange lenses, allow people to only carry everything that they need right in one package. And there's a lot of people who are moving from birding to bird photography who like this type of, of a one piece unit. With mirrorless cameras, we've got lots of stuff to choose from thanks to the innovations that we see coming out of Canon, Nikon, Sony, and Olympus, and Fuji, um, including the, the new R7 that I've been using recently. So these mirrorless cameras are bringing us into a lot of new technology and a lot of new things that we can do with bird photography. Those of you who are still using a digital SLR, the good thing about that is these digital SLR cameras are, are superior and, and really great technology as well. So we've got a lot of different options on the market now, just in terms of what kind of camera body we want to go with. And then we also have these crop sensors versus full sensors. And I show you the photo on the left of the little um, fledgling bluebird. Um, this is taken with the R7, the new Canon EOS R7. It has a cropped sensor. And same, same lens, same tripod, same location. The R5 over on the right-hand side, you'll see how far away the bird looks. And I've been shooting with full sensor cameras for the last several years, and I've kind of gotten used to this look. But then when I used the R7 and saw with that crop sensor, boy, that's pretty nice. Just to be able to have that little extra reach thanks to that crop sensor. So now we have also the options of full sensor or crop sensor cameras on our mirrorless as well. Um, settings on the back of cameras. Um, I'm a real strong advocate of, in bird photography of paying attention to your light meter. Um, your light meter is that little icon that I've circled on the back of the R7, but your light meter is how your camera is recording light. And inside your camera, you've got four to three light meters, depending on which camera body you're using. We've got the spot or the partial meter. Canon calls it partial. Everybody else calls it spot. And it's only reading about 10% of the frame. So it's ignoring everything else in the frame, all the other light in the frame. It's only reading the light right there in that first 10% of the frame. The evaluative matrix or segmented evaluative as Canon calls it matrix, as Nikon calls it, segmented as the Olympus calls it, excuse me, as the Sony calls it. This is reading all the light throughout the entire frame and reading it in different segments. And those segments, through each generation of camera are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smarter and smarter and smarter. So this evaluative or matrix, as you call it, a Nikon or segmented in the Sony's, this type of light meter is reading the light in a much more precise way than we've ever seen before. Um, and then the center weighted to me is just the old fashioned light meter. And so it's the one I don't like to use. I have a real strong love of the evaluative or the matrix or the segmented light meter because it is reading all of the light in the entire frame. So when I look over a photographer's shoulder or I see somebody on a workshop, I encourage them to move over to that evaluative matrix or segmented light meter because it is the most advanced light meter system that we have and all the cameras that we've got on the market right now. Now, what that means, though, is that you might occasionally get a backlit bird, especially when the background is very, very bright, as it is in this little stage shot that I gave you. Now, if it does happen that we're photographing a bird up against a bright background like this, then all we've got to do is overexpose in your evaluative matrix or segmented light meter. That's going to bring the bird brighter. And then, but the downside to that is, is this could overexpose your background, which means that your background's going to be blinking at you on your highlight indicator. Now, the good thing too about mirrorless cameras is that we can overexpose in the viewfinder and 
see it right through the viewfinder. Those of you using digital SLRs, you're going to have to overexpose, but you're not going to be able to see whether it's a one-stop overexpose or a two-stop overexpose or a three-stop overexpose. It's going to bring your bird the lighting that you're looking for. But with mirrorless, it's nice because we can actually see this. So if you encounter a bird with a really, really bright background or a really, really dark background like this toucan, then this is an instance where maybe, maybe you might want to move into spot or partial meter. But I find in the mirrorless, like the EOS R7, is that now since I can see my overexposure or my underexposure right through the viewfinder, I can stay on my evaluative light meter and then I can just overexpose for that previous shot. Or in this case, I might need to underexpose ever so slightly to get the toucan's colors to come out. So first setting on the back of the camera, I'm a real strong advocate of using your evaluative or your matrix or segmented if you're a Nikon or a Sony um, Canon user, because I just think this has got the best technology for us. And I point this out because a lot of photographers overlook which light meter they're actually using, and they just go straight to f-stop at shutter speed and ISO, but they're not paying attention to how the camera is reading light. So that's why I think that it's important to pay attention to what light meter you're using. And f-stops, that's still important in your bird photography. I am using wider f-stops now in my bird photography. So this, for instance, the flying turns, I'm using an F8 here, and you notice that even at an F8, which we would think of as a fairly large f-stop, I'm using an F8, and you notice that the birds in the back are still out of focus due to the f-stop. The f-stops, the apertures, the, the depth of field, so the f-stop really in the depth of field that you have, gets smaller and smaller and smaller the more telephoto you use. So the longer your telephoto lens, the thinner those f-stops or depth of field is. So using a lens like a 100 to 500 with a tele-extender, which is how I shoot, then we're going to find that, these, that this depth of field area is really getting smaller and smaller the more magnification we have. So an f8 definitely something we should use. And I show you as a comparison, this is a 5.6 using my old 500 millimeter lens. And you notice that on this Palm Tanninger, his beak's out of focus. The area in focus starts at about the eye and then drops down to these coverts. So, you know, it's a flat plane, the area in focus, your, your, your um, area that's showing out in, in nice sharp focus. So this 5.6 on this bird isn't enough to get the entire bird in focus unless I happen to be flat to the film plane to, in that parallel line of focus. So 5.6 to me is just not the right f-stop that we should be using on bird photographers. So I'm more in the F11 range. This is a Lucifer's hummingbird. I photographed the um, latter part of last week. You notice that I've still got a really beautiful background, even using an F11, because the further the background is away, the more, the more we're going to be able to blow it out of focus. But at F11, I've got a nice range of focus for that little Lucifer's hummingbird. And yeah, nice range of focus. There we go. So in, in addition to f-stop, we got to pay attention to shutter speed when we're dealing with bird photography as well, because we're photographing a moving object. So if your bird is just sitting still, looking around, just, you know, sitting on a branch, then we could use a 60th of a second shutter speed for that. In this case with the roosting duck, it's not moving. I'm lit, sitting as still as I can, so I can use a 60th of a second shutter speed on that. But once the birds start moving, then we need to go into the faster shutter speeds. So this coot running across the water, I need about a 2,000th of a second shutter speed to stop that coot as it runs across the water. We use those little benchmarks, 60th of a second for a living subject that's just looking at you, blinking your eyes, 60th of a second shutter speed will stop that. 
water forms balls at 500th of a second. So in a splash, you're going to get balls of water at 500th of a second. But if I see something like this coot running across the water, then I'm going to need at least a 2,000th of a second shutter speed to be able to stop that movement as that coot's running across the water. So those faster shutter speeds for 1,000th of a second for this incoming shoveler. And what I did with this shoveler is I locked on focus when it was way over by the horizon, kept it in my, in my viewfinder, kept it in the, you know, looking through the viewfinder, following that duck. And as he's flying toward me and the camera is continuing to autofocus on it, I'm also raising my shutter speed so that I can get it to 4,000th of a second and just holding everything until that shoveler gets close to me and then just firing away at 4,000th of a second. Eight, 4,000th of a second might even be what we need when a duck is just floating on the water, but remember that it's moving its head back and forth as it's floating on the top of the water. And so where we think we could use a 125th of a second or a 250th of a second. Now, you know what? I, I'm getting to where I just think that we need to be in that 1,000, 2,000, or in this case, if he's swimming fairly fast and bopping its head back and forth like ducks do, then we're going to need 4,000th of a second to stop that. Singing painted bunting moving his beak up and down really rapidly da, 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 as it sings its song. I'm going to need 4,000th of a second shutter speed to stop that beak from going up and down. It's not that I'm trying to stop just the static bird on the branch, I'm trying to stop that action. It's just moving his beak up and down. So those fast shutter speeds are what we need for stopping the action that we can capture with these new cameras. And then something like this, where I got dive bombed the other day by a willet, this was 8,000th of a second shutter speed to stop that willet as it was dive bombing me. So we're able to get these fast shutter speeds now. And I think that these really come in handy on our bird photography. So not overdoing it if we don't have to, but making sure that we go to those max shutter speeds when we do need it for the bird's actions. Remember, we still have to pay attention to that old formula we used to use. Shutter speed equals the millimeters of the lens to stop your own camera vibration. So when I was photographing that willet that was dive bombing me, it's flying really fast. I'm moving really fast with my 100 to 500 millimeter lens. And so we've got to think about that if you're zoomed all the way out, say to your 300 on a 70 to 300 lens or on a 500 with a one to 500 millimeter lens, then that shutter speed has got to equal that millimeters just to stop our own body vibration. And then we still have image stabilization and all that other things. But I think that this formula is a good starting point and we need to remember it and keep it in, in our heads of just how much how slow of a shutter speed we can really handhold, even though, you know, like the, the new EOS R7 has image stabilization in the body and the lens, we can really handhold some slow shutter speeds. But in general, for bird photography, I think we need to still keep this thing in mind. So we've got f-stop, we've got shutter speed, and now we need to pull into this ISO because ISO is our other consideration when we've got these different, when we're trying to get all of our settings right and our, our exposure right. A lot of people will say, just raise that ISO as high as it'll go. And, you know, I'm going to say, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not a good thing to do. Because number one, I hate to tell you this, but the more expensive the camera is, the better the high ISO is. The newer the camera is the better the high ISO is. I've sold perfectly good cameras before traded them in for a new camera that gets better high ISO handling capabilities. The worse the light, the worse the high ISO is going to be. And then of course we've got noise reduction in the camera, but that just slows everything down. So I don't advocate people even turn that on in their camera. So this little Elenia in Costa Rica, it's just sitting on a branch, but 
because I am using an auto ISO, it's automatically got me to a very high ISO. And when I blow the picture up, this is what it looks like. And so I get a really noisy photograph. And yes, I can use noise reduction software, but it still means that that photograph is a little on the soft side where I probably didn't need to use that high of an ISO on just a static perched bird. Here, for instance, you're seeing a, a ruby crown kinglet, overcast light, really bad in the winter time. The photos, you can see the grain on it. But over on the other side, I can use noise reduction and I can clean that grain out. So, you know, the high ISO isn't a real bad problem um, because we do have new technology that can get rid of it. And then in these newer cameras that we've got coming out, like the EOS R7, look at this. This is ISO 6400. And look at the quality of that photograph at ISO 6400. So the newer the technology is, the better the camera is, the better our high ISO is going to give us. And remember too, that your high ISO, the noise in your photographs is a personal preference. What somebody else might think is not acceptable might be perfectly acceptable to you. It's your photo. And the way I feel is that if I want the photo of a bird or, uh, you know, other, other wildlife, I'm going to raise my ISO as high as I can possibly get it. If that's what I want to do, it's my photo. Um, but if I find a camera that handles that high ISO really well, like the R7 with this ISO 6400, then by all means, I'm going to take advantage of that new technology. So, We've got f-stop, we've got shutter speed, we've got ISO to balance that light meter, and now we've got resolution and format. And I'm just a real strong advocate of using RAW and shooting in RAW, simply because we can process it, it gives us a better file, it, it gives us a much bigger file so we can crop if we need to, and a lot of bird photographers do like to crop, and then we have plenty of room for processing. If you're shooting JPEG, then I really would encourage you to learn how to shoot raw and learn how to process in raw. I teach a class that'll teach you introduction to the Adobe product so you can learn how to process your raw files because I just think we're going to get a heck of a better photograph out of our raw files than we are with our JPEG files. And then remember, if you're using that a digital SLR or a one-piece unit, you still have to pay attention to that histogram after you've taken the photograph. And this will tell you whether you need to overexpose or underexpose. We want a histogram that goes all the way across, starts at the, at the right where the white point is and ends on the left where the black point is. In between, I don't care how many peaks and valleys it has, I'm just looking to see if it stretches all the way across. And the neat thing about the mirrorless cameras is that we can see that right through the viewfinder because we get a real true image of what the photograph is going to look like right through the viewfinder. So we don't have to take the picture check on the back of the camera. So a neat advantage. But if you are still using a digital SLR, remember you still have to pay attention to those histograms to make sure we've captured all the data and we haven't blown out the highlights. Now, putting all that together, your f-stop, your shutter speed, your light meter, your ISO, putting all of that together, now I've got some settings on the top of the camera as bird photographers that we need to talk about. I'm a strong advocate of either manual aperture priority or shutter priority. I know some of you all might use some of the custom settings, but I find I can do the exact same thing in manual aperture priority or shutter priority. Here's a way that I'm shooting now, and this is manual mode, auto ISO, shutter speed. I set it for what I need to, like these running quail, when they were just hanging around, I might have done 2,000, but as they started running around, I might have gone to 4,000 or 8,000. You can set the f-stop accordingly, like an f8 or an f11 or an f16 you know, if you want to. 
I encourage you to make sure your camera will do this because when people first started talking about this method with the auto ISO a couple of years ago, I found that the camera I was using did not allow me to overexpose or underexpose in this mode. So make sure that if you're shooting like this, that you can overexpose or underexpose when you need to, and you can do it conveniently when you need to. Another option is to go to shutter priority, auto ISO, set your shutter speed accordingly also, front dial or back dial, whichever one you'd like to do. And then this allows the f-stop just to fluctuate. So it just moves up and down depending on what I've set that shutter speed to do. This is where I shoot the most right now. This is the way that I shoot. Make sure once again, if you try this, that you can overexpose or underexpose. And in the Canon EOS R7, that big dial on the back just allows you to do your overexposure or underexposure. So it's super easy and ergonomically works really, really well. If you're gonna use this method, then I encourage you to change your shutter speed when you need to. For instance, that little Elenia that I showed you earlier in Costa Rica, it was just sitting on a branch. And therefore, all I really needed was 1 25th of a second shutter speed or maybe even 2 50th of a second shutter speed. But because I had been shooting something else a little bit, you know, a couple of minutes before and had my shutter speed at 2000, I had my shutter speed way too high, which means my ISO was way too high. So if you're going to shoot in this method, Fluctuate your shutter speed realistically based on what you need for your bird. Therefore, your ISO is going to go down when it can and only has to go up high when it absolutely needs to. So don't just shoot the entire 10-day vacation at, IS, at shutter speed two thousandth of a second because you don't need two thousandth of a second most of the time unless your birds are doing some sort of action. So some different ways to use your camera and think about that. And then other settings on the back of the camera that I think that you should really pay attention to are your rapid release. And most of the time that's an icon of three pieces of paper next on top of each other with an H and also your servo in Canon's or your AI servo in your Canon digital SLRs or your autofocus continuous and all the other cameras. So why we're going to use that three pieces of paper on top of each other, that AI servo or continuous autofocus or the servo as Canon is now calling it in their mirrorless cameras is because when we hold our button, our shutter button down or your back button, whichever one you want to use, and when we hold it down, it just keeps firing as fast as it can based on the shutter speed and how fast your camera will fire. That one point autofocus allows us to cut through the vegetation and allows us to put that focus point right on the bird's eye when we have a whole lot of vegetation like this around this Watson down in Ecuador. So I'm a real advocate of using one focus point when we've got a lot of vegetation and then using that servo or continuous so that we get that focus that goes back repeatedly. Autofocus single or one shot in Canon means that it focuses on one spot and then stays there even if you move or the bird moves. So we need that focus point to be going back and reconnecting with that bird the entire time when we move or when the bird moves. So that's what that servo or that continuous focus is going to do. And then that one point autofocus is where we need it to cut through the vegetation. Same thing here with this Nighthawk. If you're not careful, autofocus would just focus on the stick, but we need it to focus on the bird's eye. So that's that one, one point autofocus. But many times we're photographing a bird in action and we're sitting there and we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting for that snowy egret to go in and do his, his you know, his lunge to get that that fish. So one point's not going to serve us well in this, in this case. And this is when we need to move into these wide zones. 
And I encourage you, if you haven't explored these already in your camera to explore these because they can really help us with our bird photography. So in your Canon digital SLR, this is what your, your, the, your screen looks like. And these are the options that you've got of your different focus modes. The one point over here is what I used to use almost religiously until moving into some of the newer, more advanced cameras over the last couple of years. Now, if I've got something like that snowy egret waiting to, to strike, then I'm going to go into a wide zone and let it focus. But now we have animal eye focus as well. And here's what some of your zones look like in some of your other camera manufacturers. But this animal eye that we now have in the Canon cameras um, and some of the other camera manufacturers have it as well, allows us to also tell the camera to lock onto the eye of the, of the, of the bird in that zone. And so this means that we don't have to keep that one individual zone right on that bird anymore. And let me show you a video of what it looks like through the EOS R7. So I've got it set on the wide zone and I've also got it set on animal eye. So it knows to look for something that looks like an animal eye. And you'll see that the camera thinks the hummingbird port is an animal eye, which is okay with me because that's where the hummingbird might come. So I'm gonna turn the video on and I'm on a, a medium wide zone. And you notice that where the little white box is, it focused on that. But then when I move the camera over to the hummingbird feeder, now it's locking on it. I'm gonna go into a different mode. Here's on the back of the R7. You see that we've got flexible zones. One, we've got two, we've got three. And then we've also got four, the wide zone, which is the whole frame. Animal eye is still set. And now the camera is just locking in on what it thinks is that animal eye. It's the little port of the hummingbird feeder. So sometimes it'll get stuck on a berry or the hummingbird feeder port. But you'll notice it's constantly going back in blue. And now if I go all the way back over to just one point, now I'm, the human, is in charge of moving the point around to the right spot. So here I've moved the camera around. It found that one spot, it's on animal eyes. So you notice every once in a while, it'll kind of blink at me on that little port of the hummingbird. I'm the gray square. And then the camera hooks up with me. I'm the gray square using my thumb on the back of the camera. I'm moving it around. And then the camera hooks up with me. Blue confirms that this is where it's in focus. So you notice that with the R7 using one point, I'm in charge of moving it around, which is the way we've always been, but the camera's responding to me, but I'm the one that's got to move it around. Um, so it works really, really well, but then we've got to remember that I've got to move it around as opposed to in some of the wide zones. So depending on your camera as well, I think that you need to play around with these autofocus methods because Canon, we've got four different types of autofocus methods. And I have found in playing around with these, a lot of this depends on how you move your hand. And a lot of this depends on how you move around when you're shooting. Personally, I like case two on the Canon cameras the best. But no matter what camera manufacturer you're using, I think you need to play with these and for your style and your technique versus just trusting what you might see on a YouTube video or what maybe even I recommend. This animal eye is incredible. Shooting warblers, shooting vireos, there's like this wide-eyed vireo through the brush. I've been using this animal eye for two years now on the Canon EOS cameras, the five, the six, the seven, and the R3. And this animal eye has just totally got me spoiled because of its ability to stay right with those, with the eye of that bird. Let me show you another little video of this, of this robin as it's moving around and watch how the animal eye just sticks right on that eye the entire time as it's moving around and it just kind of sticks right on that eye. It's just really, really sticky. And you'll notice that it's just right with it every single time as it's moving, as the bird's moving, as I'm moving the camera to reframe. Now watch this baby bluebird 
and watch how it even grabs both eyes at one point. Look at that. It, as a bird moving its head, that blue, see, that's where it's focusing. And it has the ability to cut through those leaves and stick on that bird's eye. So this a new ability to have this animal eye focus is definitely a game changer when it comes to bird photography. So different things inside the camera bodies, but now we've got also different equipment that we have to look at as bird photographers. And, you know, the, the smaller the number is on a lens, like a 10 millimeter lens, the wider it is. And so for our bird photography, the minimal that we would need for bird photography would be something like a 70 to 300. And I photographed this um, uh, sparrow in, in Costa Rica with 75 to 300 millimeter lens, but it's in a garden. The bird's fairly habituated to being around people. But now we've got these really neat zoom lenses like the 100 to 400 by Canon, the 100 by 500 RF that Canon has now given us, the 80 by 400. We've got all kinds of really, really nice zoom lenses. And these zoom lenses are, to me as a bird photographer, just a total game changer in the way that we photograph our birds because they give us so much reach. And each one of them can now handle a 1.4x extender. I wouldn't do a 2x extender, it's just too much, but I always shoot with a 1.4x extender. So I'm using the one to 500 millimeter lens with a 1.4x extender, puts me out at 700 millimeters on the full frame camera, puts me even more than that if I'm on the R7 with the crop sensor. These lenses are just fabulous. Um, and I really also do like these um, long zooms that are fixed. So I've used the RF 600 millimeter, F11, 800 millimeter as well. They're light, they're inexpensive, they don't weigh a lot, um, but they give you a tremendous amount of reach. So I think these are well, well worth renting and exploring. And then maybe you end up buying one of, one of them as well. These are, glass on them is really good. I used to use a 500 millimeter lens. I owned three different 500 millimeter lens by Canon over the years. And um, I got tired of the weight. I got tired of having to carry the tripod all the time, the gimbal extender. And what I did also get tired of was cutting off the bird when I got close to it, because I work a lot on getting close. So I just found that I was shooting, I was cutting off the tail a lot of times. And so I ended up when I sold my 500 being perfectly happy with it, with selling it, because I do like that ability to zoom and include all of the field marks in those birds. Cards, be sure you're using the right speed card for what you need. And we have cards now with all different kinds of speeds in them. All you have to do is do the math, file size, like 35 megabytes, frames per second, seven. That tells you you need a 245 megabyte per second card. Check the right speed on that card. If it doesn't tell you, then it's not the right card for you. And then remember too, that your camera has buffer. So there are a lot of pictures that your camera's internal memory can store for you. So make sure you have the right card, especially if you're gonna hold that button down and expect to fire a lot of action on bird photography. So when we, you know, we get something like sanderlings taking off from the beach or you get that kite that's hovering right in front of you, you don't want your card or your camera to tell you card full or you don't want that camera to tell you that, that I'm busy. No, you want that card to be able to handle it no matter what that bird might do. So we need a card that's fast enough, but don't get crazy and buy a card that's too fast. That's something that you'll never need. And then once we get all this stuff together, let's talk about getting close because getting close also gives us better bird photographs. I try not to crop if I don't have to. And so for this little um, pine warbler in my backyard, I have a small little photo studio in my backyard. And all it is is a little holder that holds a branch and it, there's a bird feeder next to it where my birds are used to feeding every single day, including right now while I'm giving this program. I can slide different branches in that little holder. And then the birds are used to landing on a branch next to that bird feeder. And I just keep a 
you know, dummy branch in there all the time. So then when I go outside on the back deck, set up my little hunting tent, my little bird blind, get my coffee, my cell phone, my chair, sit out there with my tripod and my camera, I can photograph birds coming to my backyard year round. Um, you know, same thing here with it's just a log that sits on my um, outside table on my deck. We have to move it if we ever have a company over, but otherwise I put mealworms on it and the um, peanut butter feeder that we feed the birds every day. And then when the birds pop in and I'm in my little tent, then I can photograph them. So this is a great way to get close, especially if you find yourself not able to travel as much as maybe you once did or once could you know, photograph in your own backyard with your own studio. We also have pay for photo bird photography blinds all over the country. So this is my friends in North Carolina. This is my friends in the Texas Hill Country where I lead workshops to. So these are photo blinds for birds that are maintained 365 days a year. Birds are being fed constantly. Birds are used to coming into the photo blind area. They're used to people being in the blind. This is where we can get close to our birds. Ranches in South Texas where we can get close to our birds like this Peruginous pygmy owl that set up public excuse me, not public, but for pay, photo blinds, so that we can go in and photograph birds with nice backgrounds. When I lead my trips to Costa Rica, um, I've been working with the same guide for 20 years, and we intentionally stop at coffee shops and uh, um, restaurants that have feeders set up that have nice backgrounds to them and so we can photo at lodges so this was photographed just from the dining room while I've got a cup of coffee next to me have you already figured out I like coffee um, so that I can just stand there and photograph birds as they come into what looks like a natural perch so I'm not having to slog through the jungle I do like to stalk birds, and when I stalk birds, I like to do it by myself or with only one other person so that we can be nice and quiet, listen for their songs, try to get closer to them. But walking around and just hoping to find the birds, sometimes it's not as advantageous as I would like it to be. But yes, if you learn how to walk slowly and walk quietly and look around, you can find things, cold winter day on the beach. And I found all the shorebirds were nestled down into the seaweed where it was warm. And it was easy to photograph them because they were all just trying to stay warm on a cold winter day on the beach. And if you know where rare birds like the golden cheek warbler make their nests and return every year for their nesting habitat, then you're gonna be able to get close to them. And so we can get close to birds if we know where they live. We can also get better photographs if we understand a bird's behavior. If you know, for instance, that a tufted titmouse is gonna pop onto the bird feeder, look around once and twice to make sure the coast is clear, grab a peanut and leave, you know that once that bird hits that feeder, you got one chance while his head is turned to the side to get a photograph and you better be ready. If you understand the behavior, like in the tropics, if I've got a heliconia that's got a whole bunch of ripe berries in it, birds are going to come eat those ripe berries. They're fruit. And so if you understand behavior, if you understand behavior of hummingbirds, male hummingbirds and most hummingbirds return to the same perch in between sipping through the hummingbird feeder. They go to the hummingbird feeder, they go back to the same perch. They go to the hummingbird feeder, they go back to the same perch. In my yard right now, they're going way up in the trees. But sometimes if they go down to an eye level perch, then that just means we have to slowly walk closer to that eye level perch. The better naturalist you are, the better bird photographer you're going to be. Crane hawk, if you know that when it, um, excuse me, snail kite, if you know that when the, bird, the boat gets close, it's going to leave, then get ready for it. Get ready. It's going to leave as soon as the boat gets close. If you know that when the agave are blooming in the desert southwest from May to July, every bird in the whole desert is attracted to those bright yellow flowers get ready. There's going to be bird activity on the top of that agave. If you know, for instance, that the common black hawk swerves backwards when he takes off, get ready for that. The better naturalist you are, 
the better bird photographer you're going to be, knowing where the hooping cranes are from November to March, um, and then being able to get close to them. So capturing action also fits into that knowing how to what the bird is going to be. And once again, to capture that action, I suggest that you get to know those different autofocus modes on the back of your camera. Go out, play with them, play with each one of them, see what they do. Because each one of the camera manufacturers has put technology into this. And so make sure you know what it does. Those high speed bursts when you're capturing action, a must have. But your skills have also got to be right there with it. So the common Blackhawk, I got it, I got it, uh, I lost it. I lost it. You know, a lot of golfers go out and just hit a bucket of balls to track, to practice their skills. Sporting clay people do the exact same thing. They'll go out and spend hours and money to just one clay after the other and practice their skills. How many times do we as bird photographers go out and just photograph one flying bird after the other, go to the beach and photograph every single gull that, that flies by? That's building our skills because we've got to be prepared and then just waiting for the action. I'm watching this, how, this owl with this mouse and I can tell that this drop of blood is going to fall off this mouse's nose. So I'm just waiting and 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 not letting go until that drop of blood drops off that mouse's nose. So capturing that action. And yes, I do use a flash because the difference between a flash and some birds is really startling. But I do use a flash in the field flash mode and I only use a flash occasionally now because I'm finding we just don't need to do it. So on your Canon flash, we would be in ETTNL. That gets us, that means that the zoom is telling the flash how far away we are, it's following it. And then also on high speed flash, Nikons, it would be the same thing for you. And then also knowing how far away that flash would fire. I'm using flash in particular on hummingbirds and some of the birds in the tropics that have iridescence on their feathers. But sometimes in drab light, our northern cardinal even needs a flash or that painted bunting might need a flash. So I'm trying not to use flash as much as I used to. I'm finding I really don't have to, but I am using flash sometimes when I need to. If I need to photograph an owl at night, then I'm letting the flash do all the work. Shutter priority, 60th of a second. I don't need a high speed flash, I mean a high speed shutter for this one. This is just 60th of a second. Flash on ETTNL and let the flash do all the work. So not having to use a really high, no, nothing fancy and no high shutter speed. And then if you're worried about the red eye on owls at night, then don't worry about it because in the Adobe products, we can just get rid of that with red eye reduction. So don't worry about that. So leaving you with expressions and attitudes, we should be showing these birds as if it were portrait photography, that they are regal, that they have personalities, and then anticipate the moment. Again, the better naturalist you are, the better bird photographer you're going to be. I have been studying birds since the 1970s. So if you know that every toucan is going to grab a berry, throw it up into the air, open its beak and swallow the berry, then that tells you the next time you see a toucan on a berry bush like this king palm, and you watch the toucan the first time grab one fruit, throw it up in the air, open his beak and swallow it. Whoa, guess what? He's going to do that again. So if we can anticipate the moment because we know what that bird is going to do, then we know that a reddish egret is going to spread those wings out and make that shade across the water so that all the fish will fly, will swim into the shade. We know that's going to happen. Get ready. Anticipate what the moment is going to be. 
if you know that your Carolina wren is going to jump into that feeder, do the exact same thing that that tufted titmouse did, grab one seed and leave, then get ready for it. Anticipate what the moment is going to be. Flower piercer down in Costa Rica or in the tropics will do the same thing. It'll land on the flower. It'll look out, make sure the coast is clear, and then it'll start punching the, the base of the flower to sip out the nectar. And then that hummingbird is on, going to come on that red hot poker and do something that's really neat. It's going to go all the way around the flower, that flower head. So when it's over on one side, we get one flat photograph. And when it gets over to the other side, we get the other flat photograph. Anticipate what the mo moment is going to be. If that snowy egret turns us back to the wind, all those feathers are going to fly. Anticipate what the moment is going to be. And then, you know, sitting there watching the shorebird on the, on the rocks and the waves kept hitting it, washing over it. And then it just went back to feeding off of the rocks. If you know that's going to happen, raise that shutter speed and get ready for that next wave to hit and anticipate the motion of what's going to happen. If you know that that puffin's gonna sit there with this little stick waving it in front of his female, trying to entice her into the nest or mating with him, anticipate what the motion is going to be. If you see that Arctic tern up in the Northern country dive bombing you because you've gotten too close to its nesting area, then anticipate what the motion is going to be. Get out of that nesting area. But if that guy continues to dive bomb you, anticipate what the motion is going to be. So we pull it all together as bird photographers. The settings on the camera, the features on the camera, like we've got on this new EOS R7, the features we've got, but then also understanding all of the bird behavior and being a better naturalist simply makes you a better bird photographer. So before I take some questions, I'll just recap some of the things we've, I've got coming up later on. Um, Northern Ireland, we're leaving in a couple of weeks. There's really not much chance to get on that. Um, but we've got some Costa Rica bird photography trips coming up in February. Danube Delta for the migratory birds coming up from Africa and the Middle East into Europe next May and June. And then um, some Alaska trips as well. I didn't include these. If you're interested in my classes, they're all online. And um, you can find all the details on my website about my workshops and my classes. OK, Scott, do we have any questions? We do have questions. I'll, I'll say, first of all, we could leave this up so this way people can find you in case. Sure case they don't have time. We don't want to rush them. Um, I'll first start off with Elizabeth, who I'm going to share in her sentiment, who said, this is excellent. She's going to rewatch it again. I agree. Excellent stuff. You make Thanks. me jealous of the fact that all I've got here is pigeons, but that's okay because I'm <laughs> hey, going to be- I'm, pigeons I'm gonna, are good. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to become the best pigeon photographer you've ever laid eyes on either, but, either that, or they're just not going to move out of the way. <laughs> but your beaches, Scott, your beaches are incredible up there. So quit surfing and just become a bird photographer. Yes. Yeah. Maybe I'll do both. Do both. A surfboarding photographer <laughs> of birds. I'll do it on the board. Um, <laughs> uh, so Elizabeth asked a question uh, regarding practicality. I think, um, do you use books as well as observation to learn the habits of the birds? Oh my gosh, yes. And then, you, you know, you remember, I've been watching birds since the 1970s. Um, my husband wrote the book of Texas Birds. I did all the illustration, all the photography for that. Um, my husband's been writing a nature column for the Houston Chronicle for the last 20, 22 years. His name's Gary Clark. If you ever want to, you know, just query his uh, Chronicle articles. The books behind me, that's my bookshelf about birds. And so, yes, I am reading books all the time. I'm observing. And there are many times when I just go out and watch because I find that I learn something about a bird's behavior almost every time I go out. Awesome. I think that's super poignant and, and not to take away from the wonderful camera that the EOS R7 is. It's a great camera. But I think far too many times people get so one track minded of I've got to have the best camera that's out there that they in very frequently forget that there's still the part of 
understanding what you're photographing. The better sports photographer understands the game. I am not a good football photographer because I don't understand the game. You were, we were talking about surfing earlier, Scott. And if you don't understand the sport, you're not going to understand what's going to happen. So we've got to be the better naturalist we are, the better bird photographer we're going to be. I definitely agree with that. Now, Kevin, who's joining us on Vimeo, wanted to ask, do you have any recommendations on using electronic versus mechanical shutter in the mirrorless systems? Hey, that electronic is amazing. And I'm using, I'm only using electronic when I'm doing something like a burst on um, my hummingbirds because it's hummingbird migration right now. And so we've got lots and lots of hummingbirds moving throughout the Eastern United States and the Western United States. So I'm using that electronic shutter when I'm just bursting. Um, and it's amazing. And I love it. I'm not going to use it on a daily basis. Uh, the R7, when you hold that button down, first of all, it's silent and you don't even have any idea that you're taking pictures. And so you've just now taken, you know, 148 pictures of your foot and didn't even know it. So I'm not using electronic all the time. And I turned somebody's camera on electronic during a workshop over the weekend for hummingbirds. And she said, it's not shooting. And I said, yeah, it is just check. And yeah, she just fired off 25 shots and didn't even know it. She filled up her whole memory card. <laughs> yes, exactly. With a lot of trash. So yes, this is a fabulous feature. Fabulous feature, but just be aware of it. It's one of those powerful tools you don't want to use every day. Yeah, for sure. Now I'm going to go out on a limb here and try to answer this next question. Uh, LAS Directions asked, would love to know what photo editing program Kathy is using. I know you mentioned Adobe, so I'm going to assume that Adobe is part of that. Are there other programs you're using in addition to that, or is it primarily Adobe? I am a bridge camera raw person, and then I'm using Lightroom as my catalog. I do my processing in bridge and Adobe camera raw. I am really impressed with the latest um, Canon processing software in terms of noise reduction in that it's just doing a really, really fine job on the images that are shot at very high ISOs. So I'm impressed with that. Not so much for my bird photography, but when I'm getting more artistic, I also do use the the NIC suite of, of softwares, um, especially for like my street photography and stuff like that. Great. Now, Sid wanted to know, when focusing on flying birds, do you use point focus to focus initially on the bird and then switch to animal eye focus, or do you use another method? And if so, what is that method? I'm always on animal eye focus. And okay. so the, as long as I'm working on birds, I'm on animal eye focus. So I'm on that sometimes because I, I found myself photographing a little Lucifer's hummingbird deep in a brush the other day, in a bush the other day. And where I was on a wide zone where I typically shoot, I was on a wide zone and it, it kept getting stuck on the on the, the branches. It couldn't find that little bitty hummingbird way deep inside of there. So I did have to move to the one point with the animal eye. And then immediately the R7 found the hummingbird, the Lucifer's hummingbird. Um, so that's another skill that we need to know. And with my digital SLRs, I could reach over, touch that focus point, move it all over the place, put it wherever I needed it to be. I was really, really fast at that. But now I think we need to also be able to move from wide zone to one to the, you know, the intermediate fairly fast and know which ones they are and know why we use them. Awesome. Now, uh, Ah uh, is asking, how does eye detection decide which bird to focus on if you have more than one in frame? If you have more than one in the frame, then this is where human has to guide camera to the proper bird. So if most of the time I haven't found it jumping, if, if that bird is in the back, it doesn't go back to that. It stays on the bird that's in the front. So most of the time I find it doing a pretty good job. Sometimes it'll get stuck on a berry. And, and just just want to go to that berry, you know, that's it. But it's interesting how it'll get stuck on that bird, that hummingbird port. But when the hummingbird comes in, it'll jump right over to the real eye. So it, it does have some pretty smart technology. Um, so sometimes with the camera, you've got to guide it. With the um, R7, I was doing some humming, some butterflies that had an artificial eye up on the top of the wing, hair streaks. 
And boy, it was fixated on that artificial eye as opposed to the real eye of the butterfly. So sometimes you do have to guide it a little bit. And, um, you know, you, you're the one with the brain. The camera's super smart, but you're the one with the brain. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on this question and you can hate me for it. And that's okay. I, I, I typically shy away from these questions, but I think you can handle it. And I think it is a great question. Phil's asking, R7 or I, R5? Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> so I did, I did a video on, do you buy the R5 or the R6? So I did a video on that and gave you my opinion on why you thought each one of those R5 or R7. If you are used to shooting on a crop sensor camera, and if the lenses that you have, you're going to use an adapter on, and if those are all for crop sensor cameras, then I would encourage you to go ahead and stay with the crop sensor. If, this is all ifs, that R7 is, is a lot less than the R5. So if it's a pocketbook issue, then just be aware that R7 is going to give you a tremendous bang for your buck at a lower price point. So if it's a pocketbook book issue, crop sensor. Also, the new lenses that are coming out from Canon for the crop sensor cameras, we're going to see those lower price lenses come out for that camera. So once again, this might be a pocketbook issue, or it might be that this is a nice way to go second camera, but then understand that, that Canon is coming out with these new lenses for the crop sensor. And so that's going to have a complete line of its own lenses. Plus you can put that 100 to 500 RF on there with 1.4 X extender and you're in bird heaven at that point. Yeah. Awesome. I think that's a great, great answer. Great presentation, tons of great information and beautiful images. So Kathy, I want to thank you for being here and sharing with us. Uh, definitely want to thank as well, Canon for sponsoring this event. So thank you very much to them, our buddy, Eric, who's hopefully watching somewhere in the internet. Thank you to him as well. Um, but that's it. That's all the time we have for now. I want to say thank you again, Kathy. This has been another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for joining us, guys.